as a journalist, if I'm trying to get into these clubs and see how they operate. I would say good luck. It's the military. They're covering their faces, which is never good. How often is it that you have cameras filming? Never. Do you think there's a, a race war coming? I hope so. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing it all my life. I do it till I'm laid in the casket. It seems to me like there's a fire spreading. Do you think it's too late to stop this? Well, everybody involved is making money. So it goes really deep. Do you work with the cartel? I'm actually up there. Do you trust these people? They look at you as prey. People want to kill you guys some questions. So they kill the whole empire. We gotta move, we gotta move. The black market will be here as long as the legal market keeps screwing up. Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Arelis Hernandez, a reporter with the Washington Post. And today we are talking about the issues raised in the Emmy-nominated docu-series, Trafficked. My guest is the show's host and executive producer, Mariana Van Seller. Welcome. Hi, Elise. How are you? Very good. Thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So let's start uh, where you left off. In season one, you covered everything from cocaine and fentanyl to pimps and telemarketing. Where do you pick up in season two? <laughs> You know, in many ways, I'd say that we go deeper, but we also go wider in season two. We covered, for example, the rise of white, white supremacy that initially at first thought you wouldn't think is something that falls into a black market category. But what we realized uh, when we started reporting on it is that it falls very much uh, and it operates very much like a black market. But instead of putting drugs in people's bodies or guns in people's hands, uh, these global networks are putting ideas and very dangerous ideas in people's heads. So that was one of the episodes we did this season that sort of shows um, that we're sort of going not only deeper, but also wider because things that we might not think fall under the category of black markets certainly do. Well, I don't want to give anything away, but you did quite a bit of traveling for this particular season. Can you tell me, you know, where you went, where you traveled this season and how you did that? Do it did all that shooting during a global pandemic? It's absolutely crazy. You know, this is already a really challenging uh, series to put together just in terms of access and everything that we have to go through. But um, and then add to that a global pandemic, we started filming in July of 2020 and we filmed for almost a year straight and it was certainly was not easy. Um, there was a lot of restrictions. We obviously needed to make sure that the team was safe, that we were keeping everybody safe. So there is I think I've done more COVID tests than anyone else on the planet, um, me and my team. And uh, but we were able to do it. And, you know, one of the things that we realized pretty early on is that whenever there is an economic downturn, whenever people are losing their jobs, they turn to global black to black markets. And there was an explosion in black markets during the pandemic. And actually, one of the episodes we did was about romance scammings. And it's very much a crime that was sort of born during the pandemic. And it fed off the loneliness that so many of us felt during that time. Well, I want to dig into that a little bit for people who, who are sort of unaware and live their lives sort of blissfully ignorant of this underworld. You know, how put in context, if you will, how out of control or how big this became during the pandemic, the sort of underworld uh, businesses and industries. Yeah, you know, it, you, you start by hearing about the fake COVID tests and the fake vaccines. Um, but what you don't realize is that, that there's also an explosion of drugs because not only are there more people willing to cross the border with drugs or to work in the labs to make the drugs, you know, people that don't have other opportunities at the moment to make money. There's also more, there was also more people consuming uh, drugs. And then again, I mean, I think the perfect example is really something like the romance scamming, which grew, I think it was 300 percent during the global pandemic. I mean, people losing millions of, job, uh, of dollars um, from being being stolen from them, from people that they thought was the love of their lives. Um, but you can really apply that to almost anything. And you realize that there was just a huge rise and explosion in these black markets. 
So let's take a step back. So people are obsessed, and I count myself amongst them, with, you know, true crime documentaries, right? I'm a former cops reporter myself in Florida, of all places. I imagine that you get a lot of people who are asking, you know, when they see your show, if what they're seeing is real. So how do you find these stories, and how do you build the show around those those topics? You know, or at least it would be so much easier to make the show if it wasn't real. <laughs> you, I think the people that ask that are because they haven't spent the days and weeks and months with my team and I, where we go to places, we travel far and wide to places to wait and to knock on doors, but then eventually to wait in people that have promised to show up and don't show up. You know, it's like months and months and months of trying to get access to these worlds and uh, convincing people to talk to us. And it's incredibly difficult. And that's why it's, a, it's you know, it takes... Um, several months per per episode. Um, so it's it's really hard. But eventually, I think at the end of the day, one thing that I've seen through my career as a journalist is that if you show up and you tell people um, and you treat people as human beings and you sh show up with empathy and no judgment and you're really there with curiosity and you want to tell their story, that at the end of the day, most people have a story to share want to tell their stories. You know, these are people that do things that in many cases, not even their families know they're doing. And a lot of the people, I'd say the vast majority of the people that work in these underworlds are doing so because of a lack of opportunity. I don't think anyone is born wanting to be a criminal. And so we give them the chance to tell us their stories and to tell us uh, what exactly they do. And a lot of times they're also very passionate about what they do. So they want to brag. They want to tell people, you know, I'm the best at doing this. Um, so you can never sort of undervalue uh, that, that bragging right. But I would say more than anything is this, this, this need that we all have as human beings to share our stories and to be understood. No, that's certainly true. And I still wonder, how, how do you get some of these people to, to sit down and talk with you? I know the, the appeal, the empathy and wanting to tell their stories. Are there other some groups of people that are more willing to sit down and talk to you on camera than others? Absolutely. I'd say, you know, a lot of doing domestic episodes, which we did a lot for season two, partly because of COVID and travel restrictions, um, but also because I do think it's fascinating that we usually tend to think of black markets as happening overseas and we don't realize that it's happening right here in our backyard. Um, but part of uh, uh, what, it, but it is in actually in many ways a little bit more challenging, challenging to get access to groups here in the U.S. Even though we filmed crazy things here in the U.S. during season two, uh, including a car, a guy stealing a car ten minutes from my house, where we filmed the whole operation for the episode on on uh, stolen cars. Um, but I would say that whenever we travel and report in countries where there is a higher level of impunity, um, such as Mexico. Um, or even Colombia, um, that, or, you know, and I can uh, give you a list of countries where we were for both season one and two where that is the case, um, that it is easier, I would say, because um, they're less afraid of being caught by law enforcement. Uh, here in the United States, it's definitely more challenging in many situations. How do you negotiate the ethics of that conversation? I mean, you know, I know that people come in sort of you know, with the sunglasses or with some kind of disguise or something. How do you sort of negotiate that with the person and still make that, you know, get enough content that it's an engaging conversation with this person? We are actually very, very careful with making sure that the person is not identifiable. I think it is very much our responsibility as journalists. If we tell them that we're going to do everything we can to make sure that they're not at it. And, and quite frankly, we would not have a show if uh, because the vast majority of people don't want to be on camera while while admitting to committing crimes. Um, so we, we take that responsibility uh, very seriously. Um, but again, I think it's very much about treating people. Um, you know, these are the most ostracized and stereotyped people in our society. Um, and we approach them, again, very much with empathy and with curiosity. And I want to hear their stories and I treat them like human beings. And I, I think one of the biggest powers that we have as journalists is and my main goal, I think, as a journalist throughout my career has been to build bridges. I think it's very important to create outrage as well. But I think more importantly and more important, even harder is to actually build bridges. Um, so that is what I sort of try to do with everyone, uh, with every every in, every interview I do. Of course, some are much easier than others. You know, sitting across the table from a, a neo-Nazi uh, white supremacy who's telling me that he wants to incite violence and kill people um, is not easy, and it's you know almost impossible, if not impossible, to feel any empathy in that situation. Um, but is again my role as a journalist to listen to that story and to share it with the world. 
Well, let's talk about that. How, I mean, one thing that strikes me about your show is is your composure, right? When when you're talking to these, you know, ideologues, but also potentially dangerous criminals, uh, you, you you're not phased at all, and in fact, you you talk to them, kind of your tone of voice sort of stays even. How do you prepare for this? And how are you sort of maintaining or, or are you fighting inside of yourself when you're talking to someone like a white supremacist who's, you know, actively saying things that are not true, that are that are explicitly hateful? I think if you when people watch that episode, they will see how differently I react. I think it's very visible how upset I was about some of the things that I was listening. And you can tell it in my face and you can tell it in my reactions and the way that I approach that. Um, I do think that in some situations we have to be careful as journalists because um, it's hard to re understand what exactly is the actual truth versus what they're trying to tell us because they want to be on television and because they, um, you know, they want to that shock value. Um, and, and so that is something that I, when I was interviewing the, 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 the white supremacist, for example, when he was saying some horrendous things, I, t I asked him, are, are you seriously, you seriously believe in this? Or are you just saying this because you want to shock people? I, I really have a hard time believing that this is, um, that this is what he believes and this is what he wants. Um, um, and, you know, I think that's a characteristic that I have is I, I, I do try to always find uh, place myself in people's shoes and, and try to find um, how this person got to be to be the person that they are. And of course, in the case of white supremacy it was, I think, the hardest and, and quite frankly, the scariest of all episodes we did this season. Well, I'm going to ask you a question from the audience. We have a question from Lobot Asadi in Texas. He said, did you face any specific life threatening situations uncovering the dark world of illegal trafficking? Um, you know, I don't think any story is worth a life. So there's many years of, uh, um, you know, we've I've been doing this for many years. There's a lot of training that goes. There's a lot of preparation. So we make sure that we minimize the risk as much as, po as possible. However, of course, there are situations that uh, are what I call uh, the uncomfortable moments when we do this sort of reporting. You know, in, in season one, for example, there was a moment that we were filming with the Sinaloa cartel for a story we were doing on gun trafficking. And uh, we were deep in Sinaloa country and uh, suddenly we're surrounded with these armed men with guns and, and uh, we hear a helicopter and it's the Marines and they believe the Marines are coming. And there's this huge moment of tension where they freak out and we're sort of stuck in the middle because either we flee with them and then the Marines can start targeting us, thinking that we're part of the, t the group, or we stay behind, which is also a very uncomfortable situation to be in because we'd be left all by ourselves in the middle of Sinaloa territory. Um, so there are a few moments like that. And, and, and for traffic, we very much uh, keep filming as much as possible. Uh, we have an incredible camera team that is, uh, you know, way steadier and, and sort of braver than I in many situations where they just keep rolling. But those are moments that I think are very important to describe what life is like in places like this. Well, what motivates you in the face of all those dangers to, to keep telling these these kinds of stories? You know, I think that people don't realize, but these gray and black markets actually take up for almost half of the global economy. You know, the drug trade alone brings in between 400 and, and 600 billion dollars a year. That's more than all of the GDPs of all the countries except the top 20 uh, richest. So it's an enormous amount of money that has a huge impact in all our lives. And I also think that our jobs as journalists um, is to empower people with information. And the information of, of what happens in these black markets is incredibly challenging and difficult and sometimes dangerous to get, but it is nonetheless incredibly important. Well, I'm wondering, did your crew ever refuse to go with you because it was too dangerous or, or question, you know, the decision on whether to move forward with a specific story? There have been situations, including we're filming, we're currently filming season three. Um, there was a situation where we were interviewing a group and one of the people in the group um, 
was being very aggressive towards us and uh, made us all feel very uncomfortable, specifically the cameraman, Fred Manu, who was started being threatened by this person. And the next day we were supposed to film with this group again and we all had a, a team huddle. We talked and we didn't feel comfortable with it, so we didn't go back. So, yes, there are situations where someone might say and, you know, it's actually th something that I value very much. So after every shoot at the end of the day, whenever we can and we finish at a reasonable hour, I do like to have a moment, a dinner, uh, a drink, something where we all as a team get together and we talk about what happened that day. Um, because we do see some very difficult things. Um, and to be able to talk about it as a group is sort of very therapeutical in a sense. And it also gives us a sense of uh, how we're feeling about the story and what we're comfortable and not comfortable with doing. I hear you on, you know, wanting to give people information and, and to shed light on parts of our society and our, and our businesses that, frankly, you know, people wouldn't want to see or perhaps just don't know or have any access to. But do you worry sometimes that you might give these folks who essentially, you know, without being charged are criminals, a platform? Absolutely. And, you know, the white supremacy story is a very good example of that. I was uh, in 2008 in the first Obama election. I was uh, in um, California, actually, with my husband, who at the time was working with me as a producer director. And we spent that night with some white supremacists here in California as they were watching the election. And it was at a moment where the press, the media was talking about this rise of white supremacy with the election, with the possible election of the, our first black president. And uh, we spent the night with them. And the next morning I w we woke up and we both decided that we didn't feel like it was the time to give a platform to a movement like that, that we we felt that we were living in, in hopeful times and uh, why give these people a platform um, so that they could spread their ideology? And we didn't. Um, but you fast forward several years to last year when we started actually reporting on white supremacy um, in October of 2019. So two months before, sorry, of 21, sorry, of October of 2020, two months before or three months before the Capitol invasion. And we filmed with the Proud Boys. And uh, and it was something that, again, we discussed. It was it was my idea. I wanted to do a, an episode on this and I discussed it with my team and then we discussed it with National Geographic. And of course, I mentioned we mentioned the same thing. Are we giving people a platform? But at the same time, I think that it was important that we did so, so much so that three months later we saw what we saw. We saw an attack on our democracy uh, with the invasion of the Capitol. So I think it was more relevant uh, than ever. And uh, yeah, it, it's a constant debate that you have to have as a journalist list is how how much do you become a platform for them um, and versus how important it is to tell the story. Understood. Well, you've had a long career covering conflict zones and reporting on black markets. What, what do you think attracts you to these types of stories personally and, and uh, to the underworld or the underbelly of, of our societies? Mm -hmm. It is not the adrenaline uh, at all. I think most people think that she, you know, this crazy person wants to go to these places because she lives off or feeds off the danger that is could not be further off from this truth. I think what I really have been attracted to from the beginning, you know, one of the first stories I ever did was about the jihadis, Syrian jihadis crossing into Iraq to fight against uh, the American, um, the Americans fighting in Iraq at the time. This was I was in I was in New York City during 9/11. Um, I had just arrived at Columbia University. I had been there for a month, and I was the only Portuguese journalist in Manhattan at the time. So I'd worked at a Portuguese television station. I'm Portuguese, and uh, and they called me and uh, asked me if I could go report live on the events of 9/11. I was 24 years old, very inexperienced. Um, and that day and that week that I did reporting for them totally changed me. Um, I realized at that moment that I the sort of reporting I wanted to do was uh, where I can contextualize, why I can understand why these horrific events happen and I can contextualize them and, and try to even meet some of the people that we consider our enemies. So a year later, I moved to Syria to to enroll in the uh, to to learn Arabic, and um, and eventually started reporting from there there and met these jihadis who were crossing the border into Iraq to fight against the Americans. And I think sm the most scariest the scariest thing I found out in that reporting was that actually these 
these people that we consider our enemies are much more similar to us than we'd like to believe. You know, they're, they're mothers, they're fathers, they have kids, they have goals, they have dreams and aspirations. Um, and, you know, turning our backs on them um, is not going to change anything. And really trying to understand where that, that grief comes from um, or where, the in, you know, in the case of drug, the drug business, for example, that has such an impact on our lives, where those lack of opportunities comes to comes from that make people turn to these black markets. Um, I think for me, it was a, a very much of a, a pull to that sort of that unknown world to get answers. How has that background of, of doing all these kinds of building all these sources, learning all these different languages informed the topics that you choose for each season of the show? Like, how do you know what stories you're going to go after each season? We have a long, long list of black markets all around the world, some that I'm so passionate about, but National Geographic <laughs> doesn't agree with me on. <laughs> um, but uh, but the vast majority, you know, we have a, I have a big team, an incredible team of uh, producers and directors, and uh, we have uh, daily calls and we talk about stories we're working on and future stories, and everybody has an input, and uh, and eventually we find stories that we believe are not only important that are relevant for a U.S. audience and a global audience as well, and stories that we think are actually feasible because there are a lot of stories out there that although incredibly important are just almost impossible to, to do. And and uh, believe me, we actually do go after a lot of almost impossible stories, but there's some that we know it's just, we have 10 of these to produce in a year and, and some we know we can get access easier. Any clue as to which topics National Geographic will let you go toward? <laughs> You know, it actually, an interesting one that is going to be the premiere episode of season two is about uh, black market plastic surgery and cosmetic surgery. And uh, initially, you don't realize that it is actually quite big and that is actually um, having a terrible negative effect. People are getting really badly injured and some people are even dying from it. Um, but it's not as easy as pitching them on a story about meth or guns, which is so obviously a, a large black market it with a lot of relevance. Um, so when we when I first approached them with that, that idea, it wasn't an immediate yes, but um, but I'm, I'm very persistent and I didn't give up. And uh, and eventually we went after the story uh, that was initially about these butt injections, these silicone uh, underground illegal sort of black back alley injections that are done all over the United States to make women have uh, larger butts. And they're incredibly dangerous and women are dying. But through our reporting, we realized that there's actually an even larger story with these sort of low cost uh, clinics in strip malls in Florida that are preying upon um, minorities um, and, and that are also very dangerous and where people are also dying and very little sort of oversight has been done. Well, I want to talk about that more, but I'm just going to take pivot very quickly to an audience question that came in from Joseph Oyer in, in Massachusetts. In the countries where traffic goods originate, what roles do governments play there? Uh, again, it's interesting because we truly believe that uh, the goods and the, the, the black markets exist in foreign lands. Um, you know, you take something like the drug epidemic and you realize right now here in the United States and you realize that the worst drug epidemic in American history was made right here. It's American made by American pharmaceutical companies that knew full well that what they were doing was, was um, you know, fueling uh, this horrific epidemic where thousands of people are still dying every day and yet nothing stopped them. So we can continue pointing fingers at other countries, um, but I think we won't, we need to start with ourselves. And actually that's one of the reasons why so many of the stories we did for season two um, where our, our peer happened here in the United States, because I do think it's important for us to realize what's happening in our own backyard. Getting back to the, the cosmetic surgeries, the, the butt lifts and all of that, uh, there was at one point in the show, again, not wanting to give anything away, but you draw comparisons between what motivates these women to get these very serious and complicated and dangerous surgeries to your own Botox injections. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about that narration and why you drew those comparisons? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, you know, and that's, I think, why it was so important for me to be open about the fact that I get Botox injections on my forehead and, and to, 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 
say that, look, it's not that just them. We're all sort of uh, victims of this. And I am myself, you know, I, I think a large part of it is is social media. Um, there's an enormous pressure. You talk to any teenager these days um, about the impact that social media has on their lives and the pressure that it has for them to look a certain way, especially, unfortunately, women. Um, and female teen teenagers, and it's it's horrific. There's it's really 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 scary, and that was something that I wanted to be very transparent about. That you know they they feel this pressure. I feel it too, and I think to some extent we all do. Um, but you know, and f fortunately, um, or you know, I, I if I were to do a larger plastic surgery, um, I could probably afford a, a certified plastic surgeon here in Los Angeles, where I live, or elsewhere. And in many of, the, of these cases, there are women who cannot afford these certified surgeries, and so they have to resort to either back alley uh, silicone injections, incredibly dangerous ones, or to low um, cost sort of strip mall clinics in Florida. Uh, trans women are a sizable portion of the women who are undergoing these types of surgeries. Why is that? That is absolutely true. You know, I don't think our healthcare system treats trans women um, very well. Um, there isn't a lot of, uh, uh, we don't pay for many of their surgeries. We, um, and we haven't for years. You know, recently I interviewed actually uh, one of the pumpers uh, for the podcast. We also have a tra traffic podcast. Uh, we interviewed a, a, a pumper who's a trans woman herself, and um, she was saying that when she went um, for what she called her, her sex change, she traveled all the way to Argentina because it was much cheaper there. And her description of the operation of the surgery was horrific. And again, she couldn't afford to go come back and go to a plastic surgeon to get the body that she wanted and that she believed she uh, uh, sort of uh, needed to have that would make her happy and make her feel complete. Um, and so she had to resort to initially getting injections herself and eventually she became a pumper and is now doing time in, in prison because um, eventually one of her clients died. The majority of your subjects are black and brown. What role does race and economic background play in all of this? I think it has a great, a big role because it's about inequality, right? It's again, I think nothing more than that shows us that it's not because there's a bigger propensity of black or brown to enter worlds of crime. Of course not. It is the lack of opportunities. It's the inequality that exists. Again, nobody is born wanting to be a part of a, a drug uh, cartel or, uh, you know, to go out and pump and inject people with deadly substances. Um, you know, I, in, in so many of these cases, I'd say in the vast majority of the people that we talk to, it is a lack of opportunity. I will never forget in season one when we, for example, filmed this kid who was traveling through the, the high Amazon um, uh, mountains in Peru, and he was carrying these loads, heavy loads of cocaine on his back, him and his friends, incredibly dangerous journey, not only because of the elements, it gets cold and everything, they have to walk for days and days on end, but also dangerous because they're rival groups that come and attack him. He'd seen friends being killed in front of his eyes, so horrific stories. And when I, when I sat down with them at night before their long journey, I asked them, so what is it, why do you do this? Why, wh what, what, when you were young, what were you dreaming of doing? And one of them said, I wanted to be a dentist. My, my my dream all my life was to become a dentist. And I said, why a dentist? He said, because I'd really love, I love to make people smile, big smiles. But unfortunately, my family can't afford for me to become a dentist. So what I do here, he was 17 or 18 years old, is try to save some money. And the only way that I can here, and the only job that is offered to me in order to be able to perhaps one day uh, get my dream, go to college and become a dentist. And I will never forget that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. We're running quickly into the, the end of our time, but I wonder if there's a moment or an episode that just really stood out to you and, and what your takeaway was from season season two. I think the, the white supremacy one is a very, it's not something that you initially think as a black market, um, but realizing re really early on when we started reporting on it, how these global networks truly operate um, like trafficking networks, you know, but instead of putting uh, drugs in people's bodies or guns in people's hands. They're putting violent and dangerous ideas in people's heads. And to see how these groups, you know, we interviewed uh, um, victims, fa family members of victims of the El Paso shooting in 2019. And that was one of the hardest things, you know, hearing people 
who were targeted because they were Latinos. And one of the women that we interviewed was actually there and was able to protect and save a lot of people by getting them through the back door of the Walmart at El Paso while a gunman was shooting and targeting Latino people. It was it was really painful and hard to see. And then to realize that these, these attacks are actually linked or this attack was actually linked to what happened in New Zealand just a, a, a little bit before and is linked to what happened in, in uh, Norway several years ago and how there's sort of a communication uh, online and a distribution of these materials and violent materials online um, was really, really scary. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And unfortunately, we are out of time, so we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us, Mariana Von Zeller. It was a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Adelise. It was my pleasure. And thank you for tuning in today. If you'd like to check out what interviews we have coming up, head to WashingtonPostLive.com and register to find out more information about upcoming programs. I'm Marilis Hernandez, and thank you for watching.